Hey, welcome to Point and Shoot. Uh, I'm your host, Susan Hagstrom. This is our show about basic photography. Today, I'm really, really excited to have a super guest. I think you guys are really going to enjoy Peter Pereira. He's come to us today from New Bedford, Mass. Uh, before that, uh, from Portugal. He's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, how he got here and how he got to the stage he's at being an amazing photojournalist. He's a staff photographer for the uh, New Bedford Standard Times. Uh, he's won tons of awards, highly acclaimed, but that's not what I think makes him most special. Um, most special are his amazing images, and we're going to see those as well. So thank you so much for joining us today, Peter. Thank you, Susan, for having me. Um, so I know you had kind of an interesting uh, route he, uh, to where you are now, not, not maybe the typical thing. Tell us first just about um, how you got interested in photography. Um, my, my journey to where I am today is really rather interesting because, I mean, when I went to college, um, I went for computer engineering, and that's the degree that I have. Um, but when I was really young, and we were still living in Portugal, um, I remember a cousin of my dad's um, coming to visit us, and he, and he was a photographer. And I remember going to a medieval castle, dragging his cameras along <laughs> with me. And I think from that moment is where my interest for photography really started, because it, it kind of hit me that an image was forever. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. I don't think about that all the time. And then once you decided that you were going to leave the uh, glamorous life of technology and head into photography, was your training then sort of um, formal or informal, more hands-on? How did how'd that work? Um, never took a class in photography, to be honest. Okay. Um, but there was always this, this desire um, to be a documentary photographer. Okay. Um, I remember when I was in college, um, I would be studying your typical computer engineering uh, stuff, which is hardware and software and so on. But I would always be looking at like Time Magazine. I would always be looking at National Geographic. And I would always be wondering like, you know, I, I really love photography and this is truly what I want to do. Okay. So I started really taking my photography a lot more seriously when I was in college already. Okay. When I got out and I opened up my computer company, um, every chance I got to go photograph whatever it was, uh, that was where my training was really, was on the field getting images, but more specifically the type of photography we call photojournalism, which is documentary, which is the fly on the wall, which is documenting specific events or, or uh, themes that you're interested in right. covering. Okay, and so um, you're the staff photographer down in New Bedford at the paper. Can you give us a little day in the life of what's <laughs> that, what that's like? Um, New Bedford is a great place. It's a very interesting, dynamic city. So there's a lot going on. But a typical day for me would be, um, on average, I get maybe one, maximum two, three assignments, okay. uh, which gives me the time to explore other avenues that I'm looking into. So okay. if I'm working on a project on poverty, I might stop in in a shelter, I might stop in, I might drive around looking for a feature, for instance, uh, just looking for interesting things, interesting um, events. Right. So my day starts at 7 a.m., jump in my car. If I don't have any assignments, I point northeast, south, west, and I just <laughs> drive in that direction. Okay. Look for interesting things, uh, always looking at my watch to see when the assignment's going to happen, if I have one. Right. Shoot the assignment. Uh, I'm usually back at the paper around 1.30, 2 o'clock. Okay. And then I try to take all the previous hours of shooting and I compress it into an hour and a half of processing, <sighs> transmitting, captioning, and that's it. My, done, my day is done. Okay. So that's the thing about working for a newspaper. It's, it's news, right? Because yeah. it's, it's, it's not old, it's right? Non -stop. So it's, it's, it's non -stop. always fresh. Which I think is the beauty of, of, <clears throat> of newspaper photojournalism. Um, it's never different. It's as a photographer, you're expected to be able to do every type of photography, right? Not just uh, covering sports, for instance, but you sh you you have to do food shots sometimes. You okay. have to take portraits. So, very interesting, very dynamic yeah. type of photography that you when you're a, a photojournalist. Which seems like your personality is very well suited for that. Yeah, I mean, dynamic I, yeah, is a I, word I would use. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. I'm, I get along with people, yeah. so I'm always comfortable in whatever situation. And, and a lot of times, as a photojournalist, you do find yourself in difficult situations. I do a lot of international assignments, and you're in foreign countries and in, in places you have no idea right. um, 
protocol sometimes. Right. Uh, you are in like like I've mentioned before. I do a lot of work on poverty and world issues. So sometimes you're you're in in situations that you really don't know how you're going to get out of. Right. Um, but I think that if you come across as a genuine person who who belongs there. Right. I think there's always a way of, of making sure you get back. And that sounds, I was going to ask you about some tips for people who want to maybe get interested in, you know, photojournalism. And I think you touched on something right there, just be your genuine self. Exactly. That sounds like it might be a good tip. Exactly. For anyone that wants to, you know, consider I mean, doing that. I mean, like I said, sometimes you're in very difficult situations and you're photographing difficult subjects and difficult right. things. Um, and the only way that I feel that you can do that is if, if you're just yourself. If you right. believe that you belong there, that this is something that is important, not just to you, but to the community on a global scale sometimes, right. then you're accepted. And, right. and people un understand that. They feel that. When you walk into, for instance, I was in Haiti. They speak Creole, which is not really French and it's not really anything else. It's right. their own dialect of, of a language that I don't even understand. Right. So how, how are you going to walk into someone's home without being able to communicate right. with them and photograph them. Exactly. Um, and I think that's, that's something that is just in you. I yeah. mean, if you feel that you belong there, then people do accept you. It gets you. transmitted. Now, we're going to take a look at your pictures, but um, I find them very compelling. And Thank I'm you. not the only one because you've won tons of awards. A lot of people have found your work very compelling. What do you think it is that makes your images so compelling? What, what's the... Is it something technical, or again, is it something more emotional, or is it both? Um, I think it starts with the emotional component. I really do. Okay. Um, almost everything that I photograph are, are subject matters, or th things that I feel that people need to be aware of. And I'm very passionate about what it is that I do. Um, and like I said, if you believe that you belong doing this, if you truly believe that people need to see this, right. then you will be accepted and you will succeed in the most difficult of situations. You'll come back, the, you will relive those moments sometimes, and, and when I say relive, and I mean in an emotional way, yeah. I get very impacted emotionally right. from the things that I see, the things that I'm exposed to, but that is the idea. Right. And if you're strong and you, and you have the will to do it, and you have the courage to get up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror and say, you know something, people need to know this is going on. Right. And, and if you go out there and you do it, people have, a, I think, a, a renewed appreciation, not just for what you as a human, but maybe hopefully for the subject matter that you're, you're bringing to right. them. Right. And I know I, t I mentioned, you know, you've won a lot of awards, and I, I'm sure you don't do this for the awards, but it's always nice to get recognized. Of course. Um, the list is too long for us to read right now, but um, I would like you to just tell me if there's any, any of the awards in particular that really meant something to you. Well, there's... Every award means something in the sense that most of my awards have been uh, from organizations that target photography right. or news. Okay, so the New England Newspaper and Press Association. I've been seven times New England Photographer of the Year. And that means a lot to me. Of course it means a lot to me yeah. because these are coming from my colleagues. And, and yes, you go out there and you never do it for an award. I can right. assure you of that. Yes. But when you're recognized by the people who understand what quality journalism is, right. of course it means a lot to me. Right. And I mean, I was, uh, a few weeks ago, I was honored by the, the city of New Bedford. And that is very, very special to me. Right. It's special to me because it isn't a, fo a photo award. Yeah. It's, it's being a model citizen award. And that means so much to me. Right. So yeah, I mean, I, I think of them, every single one of them is special. But it is great when the city turns to you and, and recognizes all the work that you've done. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we're going to take um, a closer look at uh, Peter's images and uh, we're going to talk about them. He's going to explain um, a little more in detail the things that he's just been telling us now. So uh, stay tuned and we'll be right back. Hey, welcome back to Point and Shoot. Uh, we're here today talking with my guest, photojournalist Peter Pereira. Uh, we heard a little bit about how he got started in photography, um, and now we're going to take a closer look at some of his images. So let's take a look, and let's remember these are photojournalism, which is a whole, you know, specific genre. So um, 
What have we got here, Peter? Um, this was a fire that happened in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, um, I don't know, three years ago, two years ago. And the interesting thing was I, I'd seen the fire raging, and inside I saw the firefighters working. And I noticed that this, this firefighter, this specific man, was, was directing the other ones. And someone said, hey, I think that's the owner of the, of the business that actually went up in smoke. Oh. And I hear a woman running and crying, and it turns out that that was his mother his mother and that was the first moment that she had found out that their entire business had gone up in smoke wow. and it, it was just one of those heart-wrenching moments yeah. and and, and it, here it was you can really see this is what we were talking about that you've really captured I mean just an amazing moment that yeah, that's it's the, the, the would never have been seen exactly yeah. and and like here's here's probably one of the most difficult photographs I've ever taken in my life um, we had found out that a soldier from New Bedford had been killed in Iraq. And someone called me, and I was driving around, and they said, hey, I think um, uh, this uh, private, uh, this Marine, uh, was killed in Iraq, and, and I think he lives on, I, I forgot the name of the street, and I happened to be right there. And sure enough, I see two uh, gentlemen from the military leaving this house, mm. and they had just told this, this gentleman, Mr. Ford, that his son had been killed, and I was right there, just minutes after he had found out and probably the worst moment of his life yeah and it's really it's really difficult to grab images like this but at the end of the day I want people to understand um, in, in the work that I've done uh, called casualties of war that I don't want these guys to be statistics these are real humans and they're attached to real families this photograph I shot just a few months ago um, and it's the same mr. Ford and he had come to visit me at, at the Standard Times and he brought a photograph of his son with him and and the uh, some of the medals that he had and I took this portrait of him at the paper and you know these are difficult subjects yeah. uh, to photograph but for him to come and visit me um, it just means a lot to me right of course this was another funeral um, of another soldier uh, this gentleman uh, was a sergeant in the army Kyle Harrington and he's from he was from Swansea and the interesting thing about this particular case was I did not know uh, that he had been killed and I got contacted by his wife Faith who you see in the photo um, because she had seen my work that I had done um, with other soldiers that had been killed and she invited me to be there probably at the most difficult moment in her life mm. when when the body of her husband was returned at Providence Airport yeah and you know to be able to take images like that is is difficult but it's it's something that I feel people need to see right now this image uh, I did a piece on the Franciscan friars and what's interesting about this is this is the last piece I shot on on film okay um, it was difficult because uh, I've, we've been shooting digital for a while I've been shooting digital and I insisted on doing this on black and white film <laughs> in my infinite wisdom <laughs> And man, it was difficult because people kept on shutting off the developer thinking there was something wrong in the room. So I lost over 30 rolls of film oh. uh, of images. But so this was saved. Yeah, this was definitely saved. He was actually praying next to an older gentleman. You can just see the hand of the gentleman in on oh, yeah. the bed uh, on the edge of the cross. Yeah. Um, I took this photograph in Haiti. Um, I had gone to Haiti... Uh, just before the earthquake happened. As a matter of fact, the earthquake happened two weeks after I got back. I'd gone to Haiti because nobody was talking about Haiti, nobody cared. Uh, a few years before this, some, uh, some photojournalists had actually been killed in Haiti um, because of riots that had happened over rice prices, and then everyone just left the country. Right. And, and it was like a black hole of information, so I decided to go back to the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. I went to a school, and, and this is their, their little chalkboard. And I then love the composition here. I mean, it's just... Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that a, a lot of people don't realize is that you don't need to show, for instance, the face to get an emotion across. Right. I mean, you look at the dress on that girl in the middle. Yeah. With some buttons missing. Right. It's unbuttoned. You look at the way that the chalkboard is. It's so scrubbed out. Right. I mean, compare that to what we're used to seeing, right? Exactly. I mean, where are these kids right now? I mean, they're in a difficult situation. To them, it might be perfectly normal. Right. But we know that we, it can be better. Right. This is, this is another one of these difficult moments. Um, I was in Port-au-Prince, um, and I found myself at an orphanage. 
And this child had basically been abandoned in front of someone's home. Mm. Um, and the sisters at, at this particular orphanage uh, were doing the best they can. But in some, in some of these places, it's, it's almost impossible to do anything. There's just no assets that needed, required to bring this, this child the care that it needs. Right. And people just abandon them. Right. I mean, it's such an, a foreign concept to us. Of course. This was also in Haiti. Um, actually, this is one of the images that was used by Newsweek. Um, one of my images um, and basically the story is about how deforestation uh, basically killed off Haiti um, and I found these kids at the only um, well up in mm. the mountains above Carrefour and this is where they would walk hours to go get a bucket of water I mean it's such a foreign concept to us but right. this is what a lot of people deal with right this was in India um, and I had I went to India uh, with a writer, Elizabeth Gielb, and she and I had uh, decided we were going to visit a whole bunch of different cities, and this was in Jaipur. We found out that there was these kids that were basically living on on uh, collecting water bottle, uh, discarded water bottles, right. and they, if you can see the, the kids in the back, yeah. they have white bags, right. and they basically gamble with each other, and they live uh, on the train tracks. Mm. And this photograph ended up being on, on the cover of Harvard Magazine. And fortunately, um, some of these kids were taken in by, by an organization that deals with them. So they have some shelter to go to. Wow. I, I photographed this woman, a Pakistani, I believe she's 78 years old, and she was becoming an American citi citizen oh. at a naturalization service. And it's funny how how proud she is yeah. at that moment, um, how diverse her culture is relative to where she is now a new citizen. But yet, look how proud she is yeah. when the national anthem started pouring. I photographed this in Honduras. Um, I, we flew into T uh, the, uh the capital of Honduras. I jumped on a bus, drove for five hours, got off the bus, and I, my, my mind is always working, and, and I heard the church bell starting to ring. Mm. Uh, I grabbed the cameras and booked it up there. I had no idea where I was. I don't even know the name of this town, and I yeah. just had a photograph. That makes me think when you talk about hearing the church bells, back to that first picture where you said you, you heard uh, someone talking about something. When you're taking these photos, I'm getting the, the impression that you, your senses... I mean, yeah. you have to be totally focused on what you're doing, but yet you also need to really be paying attention to what's yes. going on around you. Absolutely. I mean, it's just a huge Absolutely. skill that it, you need to have. Yeah, I mean, f photography is the end result. Yeah. But everything that comes before it, like this photo, th this, sh this was shot in Honduras. I heard a woman um, wailing, and, and I ended up in her home, and it turns out she's been abandoned by her kids, most oh. of them who had been killed in gang, gang wars. Wow and she's living by herself. So you react, and I think, uh, unbelievably, uh, people are gonna be surprised what I'm about to say, M me being an engineer actually prepared me for this. Why, because what is engineering? Engineering is the ability to solve problems, but it's also the ability to anticipate right. with different variables what you end up getting. Exactly. So I'm always thinking a little bit ahead. Head, yeah, to see where people are going, what yeah. they're thinking. Um, well, that was really amazing. I mean, I'm glad we all got to see uh, your images, and I think now that you've seen those, you can see what I'm talking about when you are trying to make a compelling image. Um, practice, practice, <laughs> a lot right. of hard work, a lot of being in the right place at the right time, a little luck maybe, but um, mostly hard work and like Peter's saying, anticipation. Um, I know that um, you have a daily photo and you do another um, little project, uh, a little video about behind that photo. Right. Uh, we're going to take a look at one of those. So quickly, tell us about um, what that behind the daily video, how, th what, how that's set up. Um, I, st I came up with the idea that I really wanted to include people in the whole process. Um, I'm fortunate to be in the position that I am. Um, so I wanted to show people h how I get photographs for those people who are interested in photojournalism. So um, I do these short episodes on, on my YouTube channel, and it's called Behind the Photo. Um, and basically, I take you on assignment with me. Okay. 
That sounds good. All right. I know sometimes it's scary. I've seen some of yours where you're way up high in the air or way <laughs> underground right. and, and everywhere in between. So we're going to take a look at one of these behind the video. So join us. Let's take a look. All right. So it's Sunday, March 15th. And today our mission is to cover the 38th half marathon. Well, the 38th New Bedford half marathon. So let's get on it. Hey, this is Peter Pereira. Every day I find myself in new and interesting places. And this time, I'm taking you behind the photo. Today I'm taking you on assignment. Where? Well, it's the 38th annual New Bedford Half Marathon. It's a challenge because, well, the city is really long. The half marathon encloses everything in the middle. If you're not somewhere in the middle and you find yourself on the outside, well, guess what? You're not going very far. So you got to plan, you got to make it work because at the end of the day, the photos is what counts. The most interesting shot is usually not the regular one. Look around you, there's always something to create nice foreground elements that add to the photo. Perfect framing in that case. Yeah, you'll be fine. You're keeping them warm, that's half the battle. T-minus 10 minutes. Yeah, so listen, there's a lot of people shooting pics. Here's a good friend of mine, Phil, Phil Mello. Great work that he's done with the fishing community. He's got a, lot of, a, a, a big um, show at the Whaling Museum that you guys can all check out. So if you get a chance, it's important that you support guys with cameras. You know, you always see the final result, but guys with cameras, we're the ones that bring it to you. So you know something? Go check his work out. Yeah, it never ends. If you want to do a good job, you just, you got to do as much as humanly possible. I mean, I took a huge risk with the whole uh, firefighter ladder uh, vantage point. I mean, I don't know if they're going to let me. I really didn't. I mean, I made a couple of plans ahead of time as far as the Regency Tower. They never got back to me. So, uh, you know, you got to come up with alternate plans. And, and this was probably way better anyway. I mean, I was able to get a long shot. So it compresses uh, the runners. Um, and when you have 3,000 people running on the same street, you know, it makes for a colorful uh, motley crew. Not the band. <laughs> now we're heading towards the park, see if I can get some um, just regular runners. I mean, I'm always thinking of where where's a good spot as far as not, not just the runner-wise, but is there a good background, something that, that puts the, uh, the race in perspective as far as in New Bedford. Thank you. 
The easiest thing to do is get a long shot. Anybody can do that. The hardest thing to do is make every one of these people are taking photos on the side of the road. Tomorrow, they're gonna to be looking at the paper. If your photos look like every single one of their photos, you haven't accomplished your goal. You gotta come up with something interesting, a new angle, a new perspective. And a lot of times, you gotta work. You gotta run. Don't stand there. That's not good enough. Whoa, dog. There he is. The hardest thing sometimes is to just move on. I mean, you could spend way too much time, you know, trying to make a photo that at the end of the day might not even work. So get a couple of shots, it's plenty to work with, but you know, don't, don't stay too long in one position because then the race is moving on, regardless if you're on or off. Another edition of the half marathon is complete. Well, actually, it's complete for me, but there's still plenty of people out there on the course. I'm always tempted to get the last person, but you just never know when they're going to arrive. And, and the reality is a newspaper needs the photos now, not four hours after the event. So um, it's like anything else, you know, it's like a sporting event. I mean, I race bicycles, as most of you guys know, and if you get to the end of the race and you're not completely exhausted, then you probably didn't try hard enough. And it's the same thing with this. When you're covering an event, no, you're not running as much as the athletes, but you need to get to the end. Um, and when you're processing your images, you, you, need, you need to feel exhausted. And, and, and yeah, that's what it's all about. So that was Peter's behind the video. For more information on that, you can check out his website, check out his Facebook page, all of his other social media outlets. He is very prolific with his daily photos and those little videos explaining how he got those shots. It's a great uh, free information if you're interested in uh, finding out more about photojournalism. So I hope you really enjoyed our show today. I hope you enjoyed Peter's work. I know I did. Um, I defy you not to be inspired to get out there and make some of your own pictures. You know all you have to do, it always starts when you point and shoot. <laughs>